post it to Facebook later. So we can post it to Facebook later for anyone that, that missed it. Um, so you ready? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. All right, welcome everybody to another FCS 101. This is our, our second one and, and we've gotten a great response from you all. Um, you guys are really liking the content and we really like doing it. Um, so we're here today to uh, really highlight fascial counter strain and specifically its approach to headaches and head injuries. Uh, my name is Kyle Kusinose. and I'm the administrative director here at the Jones Institute and I'm with uh, Brian Tucky the developer of fascial counter strain. Um, so to, well, why don't, to start out, Brent, for those that don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, uh, good, good afternoon or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are on the, uh, the coast here tonight. Um, so yes, I'm the developer of fascial counter strain. I've been practicing the technique for about 30 years. I'm one of four physical therapists that was personally certified by Dr. Larry Jones the originator of the strain and counter strain technique, um, <clears throat> one of only four therapists that he ever personally certified to teach it before he died. And then when Dr. Jones passed away in the late 1990s, he had developed a, about 200 different diagnostic tender points and release techniques. And I have progressed that to over 1000 techniques broken down into six anatomical systems. And really it's become the most precise system or anatomical, uh, you know, specific form of manipulation really uh, on the globe today. So thank you all again for being here. Um, if you are a, if you are not a current uh, Jones Institute student or fascial counter strain student, then um, if you are interested in jumping into this paradigm and learning directly from Brian, we are teaching the entry level course to the fascial counter strain curriculum on July 16th, July 16th through 18th. And we have, because of COVID, uh, we've remodeled our kind of distribution um, and we are teaching that course um, live from Frederick. Brian will be, um, Bree and Frederick teaching to a, to a small audience there. And then we'll be live streaming that course to Pasco, Washington, San Diego, California, Louisville, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, and New York. Um, so if you're interested in jumping into this curriculum, that course is coming up just next month. If you're here, we are offering a $50 discount for that course too. Um, and the coupon code is FCS Live that you can use at checkout. Um, so to get started here, Brian, let's, let's introduce, a couple of weeks ago, Brian and I did a, an FCS uh, 101 where we introduced fascial counter strain, its physiologic rationale, um, its, its general uses. Um, but we wanna do that briefly again today. Uh, and Brian actually even has some new stuff he was just telling me about from some new research from 2021. Um, so Brian, why don't we just introduce fascial counter strain again uh, before we jump into the headache conversation? Yeah, so if you're really interested in learning the technique, definitely, you know, after you watch this today, uh, we're profiling really two specific applications, you know, headaches and post-concussion syndrome slash TBI. Go ahead and re-watch that uh, last webinar and it'll really kind of tell you what we teach you in the first class and really give you a better idea of the rationale. But basically what the modern tissue science and pain science is telling us is that uh, tender points or trigger points are really due to trapped inflammation that is found in the newly discovered pre-lymphatic pathways. So we'll go over that anatomy in a second, but basically inflammation gets trapped in the tissue. It's then, if it's in a highest enough concentration, it will produce another cytokine called TGF beta one, transforming growth factor beta one. This is expressed by specific cells throughout the body. That has now been proven in 2019 to directly cause fascia to contract at all levels, all tissues. So you can entrap via this TGF beta one production inflammation in these, in these drainage, deep drainage pathways that then on an ongoing basis stimulates the pain response coming from almost any tissue. So what this stuff is, you know, fascial counter strain in a nutshell is a uh, diagnostic, you know, application uh, that we use diagnostic tender points on the surface to figure out where this deep inflammation is trapped. And then we're going to decompress that tissue, drain out that inflammation and break the chronic pain cycle where most practitioners are going awry because they're using old techniques is that they're simply addressing the musculoskeletal system. 
And yes, the myofascia can be a pain driver. We know that. But the muscle system is more a protector of an area that's inflamed and dysfunctional. And any tissue that has a pain receptor, which is virtually all tissues, can be where this stuff is trapped. So we use the diagnostic tender points, find the tissue that is the source, drain out the source, decompression, and it breaks the entire cycle. Part of that cycle, and I'll go through this in a few slides, not only do you get chronic pain coming from either neural tissue, visceral tissue, vascular tissue, or any musculoskeletal tissue, you get pain. That pain also stimulates reflexes that creates vasospasm in the area. And this chronic vasospasm driven by this trapped inflammation actually can create venous pressure in the head, artery problems, which you can see as migraines, lack of blood flow, which creates de degeneration, and really gives you all of these findings that you see in many of your chronic pain patients. So a simple concussion can end up creating trapped inflammation, create the vasospasm, which gives you chronic symptoms, and it's not gonna go away because it's literally trapped in the tissue. We've talked about um, you know, the, the physiolo physiologic rationale being you know, a combination of neural and vascular for a long time, but are you leaning now towards it being primarily vascular, at least yes. in origin? Yes, yeah, so the, the source has to be, you know, looking at the research are again, cytokines. Cytokines are created by immune responses. So you can get the post COVID, right? Long hauler syndrome, for example, um, or traumas of any kind, even overuse can create this. And typically the body's lymphatic system will flush out those cytokines because they're, you know, they're just in a, a lower level of concentration, but you get a massive area of them. Okay. Or a pre-existing area of trapped inflammation. The concentrations get up high enough the, enough of this TGF beta ones produced, you get contraction. And that is where you'll see these newly discovered pre-lymphatic pathways can be compressed. And now you trap that inflammation. So the body can't get rid of it. So for example, these pre-lymphatic pathways are really just recently discovered and verified, despite the fact that we've been performing this technique in these various systems for you know many, many years. So 2018, they first found these pre-lymphatic pathways and they were, you know, in the entire gastrointestinal tracts around all the viscera, the urinary bladder, you know, that superficial fascia of the dermis around the bronchi, around the arteries, around the nervous system and all fascia. So basically you have the ability to have entrapped inflammation, stimulating the pain receptors in any tissue. Okay. This has now again, been verified these prelymphatic uh, interstitial pathways around all these tissues as recently as right here, published in Nature in 2021, there's the article that talks about the continuity of these interstitial, interstitial spaces throughout the whole body, and that there's really no place that's not impacted by these guys and could cause you know, chronic inflammation, disease, infection, uh, can harbor in these places. So very, very recent research finally you know, able to explain what we've been doing for so many years. And then you can even take it a step further. One of the researchers on the paper that uh, currently trying to get published on this exact paradigm, uh, Dr. J.P. Shaw from NIH, back in 2007, knowing that this was true clinically, I had Dr. Shaw in a trigger point, active trigger point, him and his team at NIH developed a microdialysis needle, a tiny little needle that could go into the interstitial space and sample that, not the blood, the clear fluid, like a blister fluid, and to see if there was any inflammation trapped in your active trigger points, your painful trigger points. And guess what he found? He found that there were 23 different chemical uh, inflammatory mediators were elevated compared to non-painful tissue. And this particular study made Dr. Shah world famous in 2007. Now, how it got trapped there, that's, that's kind of stuff that I'm giving you guys a little piece of. And that's what my current paper it, that is in peer review um, is gonna talk about. So this, this always reminds me of a, of a quote from a public health official back during like, the medical renaissance. I think his name was Paracelsus or something like that. Uh, but he said that there is but one disease in the body and its name is congestion. So this really plays right into that, yes. Yeah, and you know, how many times have you, you know, seen in the research and heard in research recently that inflammation is the root of all disease, okay? So it turns out inflammation is the root of dysfunction. Now, the, the, what, what we're trying to really tell you guys tonight though, and I want you not to lose the forest for the trees here, this is obviously a wonderful uh, finding that tells us why we can have chronic pain and why does it not go away? 
So the key thing about pain research is that everybody knows you can stimulate a pain receptor, but they just stop stimulating when they're no longer stimulated by some type of, of chemical or mechanical trauma. They just turn off. So everyone's like, we know these things have pain receptors, but what causes chronic pain? Well, it turns out you have to entrap allogenic, you know, pain causing chemicals because they stay in this area ongoing and can give you chronic pain. And that's your tender points, your trigger points that tell us exactly what tissue it is. And I've spent, you know, my life basically, you know, the last 30 years and, you know, expanding Dr. Jones's work and figuring out what these surface tender points are telling us as far as where the source of the trapped inflammation is. Okay. Now, once this inflammation, it creates pain. The key thing is, again, it can stimulate myofascia to generate pain. So myofascial pain, it can stimulate the nociceptors in the organs or the viscera. You can have visceral pain. You can have vascular pain because the outside of the vessels also have these pre-lymphatic pathways and pain receptors. So you can have all types of pain, venous, arterial, and visceral, and even neural and muscle. Okay. Once this, let's say this green arrow talks about the source. So here we have inflammation around the capsule of the liver. That's the example. That pain response, those nociceptors fire that, those chemicals fire that neuron, and it's going to go into the, to the spinal cord in the area of the dorsal horn. And the first thing it does is it stimulates muscles to contract and protect the area. So those are your muscle guarding reflexes. So even in this case where the source was the, you know, let's say the triangular ligament of the liver that got torn and inflamed, you're going to see a, a surface muscle tension and spasm. And a person might say, oh, this is a, um, you know, this is a diaphragm spasm. Okay. You might feel tension in the respiratory diaphragm. And you can go digging on the respiratory diaphragm, but it will not let go permanently until you get rid of this inflammation. And this happens everywhere. You know, you could have kidney fascia, again, using that trapped inflammation of that organ, and it would make the quadratus lumborum spasm. So once again, you go in and you do a needling or a stretch or a massage on the quadratus lumborum, but you didn't get to this depth and you didn't sh uh, shut off this area, and drain this area of trapped inflammation. Now, could a muscle be the area of inflammation and be protecting itself? Yes. Okay. So there, the myofascial techniques work really well. So that's why you have successes going in there and working on the trapezius uh, when it was a trapezius strain. But here's the key part for this discussion where we're going to head now into headaches and we're going to head into post-concussion. This pain receptor not only stimulates the alpha motor neuron and gamma motor neuron muscle guarding reflexes, it also goes into the intermedial lateral column and stimulates via, you know, what are called viscerosomatic and somatosympathetic reflexes, sympathetic nerve activation. And this nerve, which comes out from the same pain responses, makes the vessels spasm in that area. So you get vasoconstriction in the same area where that inflammation is trapped segmentally. So you can get chronic artery uh, vasospasm. This could be a migraine. Okay. This could cause a lack of uh, blood supply long-term to an area and make it degenerate. And of course you also get venous vasospasm. That's why it says arterial and venous, which then of course makes that pressure build up in that area, swelling build up in that area. And, you know, again, looking at, for example, what we're talking about tonight, artery could be migraine. Venous could be the chronic pressure that is felt in the heads of those post-concussion syndrome patients. So to simplify this down for, for your, your orthopedic uh, clinician, right? Okay. Uh, so let, let's just take this down one more level here. When I feel a muscle tension on the surface, there's a couple of possibilities here. All right. The one is that this chronic guarding is a guarding of a musculoskeletal structure. But what we now know is it's inflammation in any pain receptor that responds in here to the cord. So the source could be not just musculoskeletal with muscle tension on the surface. It could be visceral inflammation, vascular inflammation, neuroinflammation. It could be much deeper. And here, when it's in these layers and trapped in these tissues, this is where you see things come back. This is where you can't quite get it to let go. This is where you manipulate it and it tightens right back up. This is where you need it. Musculoskeletal comes right back. Okay. And even in musculoskeletal, what if it's at the level of the deep ligaments? and you're still rubbing the, the muscle on the surface. All right, it's, not, yeah. it, it's still gonna come back, right? So even musculoskeletal stuff can be deep musculoskeletal. And we need to get down to that level 
and get that inflammation out of their hood to break the protective reflex. All right, so I, I was kind of describing to my patients and that we're, we're decongesting receptors that are excited by the chemical irritation in, in the fluid, right? Um, and the way that our, our bodies protect itself from, from us, right? So your body's protecting itself from you by causing pain, by causing muscle spasm, which limits range of motion, and by causing inhibition, which, which is, presents as weakness in the body, right? So all three of those things we can get from like a liver dysfunction, like a coronary ligament dysfunction is, is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. So, so, you know, we know in the science that these tissues have pain receptors, you know, so you can have organ pain. Everybody knows that. Sure. But what everyone thinks is that the organ receptor is going to cause just organ pain. And, but it, it's what it presents as almost every single time is what appears to be deep chronic musculoskeletal pain. Right. So the, the brain is much more accustomed to reading uh, you know, surface skin responses and all that with the words called convergence, where the organ, you know, neuron converges with the musculoskeletal neuron, converges with the skin neuron, all at the same area. And we perceive the skin or we perceive the muscle. But where, where is the inflammatory driver? That's the key. We got to find out where that trapped inflammation is. And this new research says it can be in any of those tissues. So, okay? in, and in, in treating the correct tissue, which we can diagnose with the scan and with the, the correct tender point. And the then, diagnostic tender point, yep. yep. Then, then you'll decrease pain, you'll improve mobility, you'll improve strength, kind of all the, the things that we work on in, in the orthopedic setting. Right, so, so the person doesn't you know, come in after taking the inflammation off the triangular ligament and say, wow, my liver enzymes are awesome. You know, they, right. That's not what they say. They, they're like, you fixed my chronic low back pain or you know, I'm breathing better. And that, that pain alone, that was my you know, inferior trapezius pain is, is gone. That thing that the chiropractor pops every, every, you know, that T7 that gets popped every weekend. I don't need that anymore. Right. Right. Okay. Awesome. If you, um, uh, you know, like Brian already mentioned, if you're interested in, in reviewing that video, um, it should be in the comments section. Now the link to it, um, if it's not, it will be real soon. So please go back and watch that video. I think we talked, uh, for about an hour on FCS kind of basics and fundamentals. Um, so let's move forward into um, kind of our post-concussion and headache um, discussion. So you, Brian, you've been, you always say you're in the trenches, right? So you're in the trenches as far as technique development, but also um, also research and rationale. Um, so I know with your, with your patient population, you're doing a lot of, of cranial stuff, not post-concussion type stuff. So before patients come to you, what kind of treatments are they getting post-concussion? What are, what are non-counter strainers doing um, for their patients post-concussion? I, I would say the, the vast majority of them were pretty much told by their referring physician that, you know, given some time, they're going to be okay. And, and they're really not a lot has happened with many of these, these patients as far as treatment. Um, some have undergone desensitization. Some have have undergone various forms of, of you know, therapies um, that are really more hands-off. A few I've had maybe some, some cranial work done, some, some craniosacral, et cetera. But I would say the vast majority uh, are just home suffering, to be honest, and they're just told to, to wait it out. Um, the research tells us that 80% of people don't get post-concussion syndrome. And there's a very fine line between a mild TBI and a, and a major concussion. They're basically very similar. Um, the, the TBI crosses the line where you start to see some, some findings on the diagnostics, but post-concussion syndrome and, and doesn't show up on the standard diagnostics. And it's not until you do post-mortem studies and people had multiple concussions, do you see the neurotangles, the tall proteins, you know, like your, your, uh, basically your patients who end up with the CT chronic traumatic encephalopathy, all the athletes. So they do and post-mortem find some stuff in these guys, but you know, they're basically told, yeah, you know, there's really nothing wrong with you. And, you know, their symptoms go from, uh, they really can't use their brain long. It fatigues on them. Okay. So they have light sensitivity, chronic headaches. If they try and do screen time, they start, you know, their head starts hurting. They try and concentrate their head starts hurting. And we're going to talk in a second about the fact that it's really the filter of the brain, the glymphatic system that's impaired. So as your brain starts to make waste products, it can't get rid of them because that, that vasospasm that we just talked about is blocking the normal drainage pathways. And it's very inefficient. Well, and they're getting, you know, really massive amounts and, and very thorough testing and, and diagnostics and, and all sorts of stuff. But at the end of the day, the intervention afterwards is just 
kind of guided desensitization exercises or, or specific desensitization exercises for whatever area of their brain was the most impaired via that testing? Is that kind of? Yeah, that, that's really been my experience. But um, I, I find so many, like just using this week as an example, and you know, when I lecture, I always try and use something I just did. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my first patients on Monday, um, I had forgotten that she sent her son to me last month. And I, I usually see patients often once a month, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll do like a, an hour session once a month or once every several weeks or people will come in um, and they'll do two or three days with me from like out of state and then they'll fly back out. So I, I often forget, you know, what I, who I treated. So she came in, she said, first thing I want to do is thank you for what you did for my son. And I'm looking at her and I'm recognizing her. And I'm thinking, I barely remember your treatment. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, uh, refresh my memory. She's like, she's you know, my son who couldn't wake up. I'm like, oh, 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 so she had told me that her son dropped out of college because he had, you know, multiple concussions playing hockey and she would take him two to three hours in the morning to wake him up. He could not get up. You know, his brain just would not function. So he just dropped out of college. And she said, you know, have you ever treated that? And I said, honestly, I've not. That's a that's a pretty unique post concussion syndrome. I said, does he have headaches? Does he have? He said, oh, yeah, he has all that. I said, well, you know, bring him in. Let me let me do what I know I can help. But if it helps, helps. But anyway, she said he was, you know, he gets up in 10, 15 minutes now, which in three hours is totally different. And she said he changed his life. He's gone back to school. Um, but at that, I really saw the kid, you know, one hour and a half session. And but what, he was sitting home just in his bedroom, dropped out of college. And that's that's somebody I saw on Monday's, you know, uh, follow up. Very, very typical. So I don't see that these people are getting a hell of a lot of uh, intervention, to be honest. Right. So, you know, in, in a lot of patients, these assessment, you know, thorough assessment plus desensitization. Um, it, it does work. And just like, you know, we know exercise can work in the orthopedic population too, but you know, where fascial counseling can really aid uh, the practitioners is for those patients that it's not working. Right. So um, what are you finding in the patients where that come to you after already going through all this testing um, and exercises? Yeah, there, there's a, there's a group that absolutely respond. There's a group, there's a large group that partially responds. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a very large group. And then there's a group that are actually aggravated by it and drop out. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the group that responds, well, I just don't see. Right. So they don't end up, you know, waiting, you know, eight, 10 weeks to see me. So um, I, I don't see that group. So, I, you know, now, I, I know good? it, I know it can. Do you think that they're good because they've responded to the exercise? Or do you think they still have the dysfunction? Well, I, I think the actual definition of what, you know, you've just described there is in like in a, a desensitization or an accommodation, right? Yeah. Your body is through potentially plasticity and reflexively working around the problem. Okay. Okay. So, and I'm a hundred percent advocate of doing exercises, but what we would like to give you the skills to do is to add, you know, take the inflammation out of that area, drastically drop down those symptoms and then put them through the program to just really kind of, you know, uh, you know, make it, make it really last nicely for you. Right. But, uh, you know, I think all exercise is trying to work through this reflex arc through the musculoskeletal system. And again, in musculoskeletal cases, it works much, much better than it does with vascular, visceral, or neural inflammation. It's much less successful. Right. So what are you doing? What are you doing when you have a, a new patient come in with post-concussion post -concussion syndrome? So let's, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the, the treatment. And I'll show a little bit of, of venous stuff that people can see. Um, and then I'll talk a bit more about how we do it and even some techniques that are in the first class that, that you can use. So the first thing, just as a general diagram, is that we're going to find the involved tissue and we're going to perform a glide into the direction of ease, which then opens up these, these lymphatic, pre-lymphatic valves and pulls the inflammation into the lymphatic vessels. Okay. So basically it's kind of like the Chinese finger trap. You know, if you try and pull it, it gets tighter. And if you slacken, it opens. So we decompress the tissue. Then that, of course, negative pressure, it all drains in and we pull that trapped inflammation out of the interstitial space, okay? And that is done. We knew what level to glide because of the diagnostic tender point and what is called the cranial scan, which is something we won't get in here, but it basically is a way of using cranial motion testing to know what systems are involved. So we can very quickly say you have a sympathetic nervous system problem, a venous problem, an artery problem, or musculoskeletal, and then go check those points. So this motion test of the dura allows us to do this very fast, even though there's so many techniques, but that's the decompression. So no, no trauma. And by the way, this, this decompression unloads 
the pain receptors. So mechanically, the pain receptors relax. The, the chemicals start to drain out. Um, some of the chemicals that drain out are actually norepinephrine, which creates vasospasm. As that drains out, then the vessels really open up, artery flushes in, vein starts to, to drain out, and you get a therapeutic pulse. You start feeling this pulsation, and this stuff just goes and just drains out. Completely painless technique. I treat infants, elderly. You can have an osteoporosis, severe, completely gentle. Um, many people be like, that's all that took? You know, like, yeah, that, that was it. it. It's, it's something that they're used to getting kind of rolled or, you know, you know, somebody taking a, uh, you know, one of these metal tools on them or something real painful. Um, that's it. And we just do that in very specific tissues. Now, for example, and when we're talking about vessels for concussion and we're talking about vessels for, for migraine, some of those discovered pathways are wrapped around the tunica adventitia or tunica externa of the vessels. And on those, that, outer fascial wall of all vessels are pain receptors as well. So when you inflame this tissue, there is reflexive connections into the dorsal root, into the dorsal horn, back through an interneuron to the efferent branch that goes to the smooth muscle. So whenever you inflame or stretch a vessel, it contracts. So you get this even local vasoconstriction of that particular vessel. We can drain the inflammation on that vessel locally even and relax that vessel and open it back up, okay? So there's all these reflex arcs that are all based on the trapped inflammation. So find it and drain it. If, here's a case study, okay, just to show you this, you can't see this inside the brain and you can't see this when we, do, when we work on these deep lymphatic channels like in the spinal cord or the epidural system. But here's an example of us doing it on a case you can see. Unless so this there's a Herx though, right? It what now? Unless there's a Herx. Oh, yes. Yeah. People can have a, a post-infectious, right. They could even have a little bit of a fever. Um, the first COVID person, post-COVID syndrome I worked on, the lady had pericarditis. I drained all the inflammation, the mediastinum and pericardium. And she, she was like, well, I can, I can breathe. And it was post, you know, for the first time. Well, that night she spiked a really, really nasty fever, which tells me in the pericardial fluid was either viral fragments or, or, or virus still living. And her immune system attacked and she spiked the fever. And people say, oh my God, that's horrible. No people, that's good. Because that's why she had the chronic inflammation and symptoms. And so she spiked the fever, her body recognized it, her body killed it. And then she started to make a great recovery. So I, you know, you can see it through that reaction, which is called a Herx reaction, right? Um, anyway, so this lady broke her fractured her humerus actually mildly on Christmas Eve and went to the, to the ER because she was in severe pain and uh, basically this shot was taken by her husband the day coming into rehab. And this was nine days post-fracture. And anybody out there in the audience who is lymphatic trained will recognize this as the right upper quarter lymphatic watershed. And you can see the immense tension, okay? And all the inflammation and uh, bruising, obviously, and even the shininess of this, of how much pressure is in this arm. Um, one of my uh, teachers slash old students, Tim Hodges, treated her he texted me this picture and he said, Brian, would you treat her? And I texted him back and I said, did they do a Doppler? Because it was an immense amount of bruising. And he said, yes, and it was negative. I said, yeah, go for it. So this was nine days post. So Tim treated all her venous you know, vasospasm all the way down, even some arteries to open up both sides, down and got to about right here and ran out of time. Um, so this next picture is what her body could do 48 hours later, okay? without the vasospasm. There it is, okay? And the really cool part about this picture is that he did run out of time and you can see where he stopped the counter strain treatment. So these distal veins of the radial and ulnar branches here were not decompressed and she had very little improvement in that area. And then I, I, I asked him one day, I said, I said, you know, it's pretty amazing how it was able to drain the fingertips yet we didn't get to these vasospasms. He said, no, no, that's not what happened. She said, aren't you going to do anything for my hand? And he, and he, and he uh, put her hand in Arnica and he, he lathered her up in Arnica. And he said, that's, that's what did that. Uh, but it still couldn't drain past the wrist. But anyway, so the point being, if you're thinking about someone with a, a pinched nerve in the back and chronic low back pain or post-concussion syndrome, this amount of inflammation can be you know, hanging out in the cranial uh, fluid in the glymphatic system. And so you wonder why you have a chronic headache, you know, that, that is not... That is not good. Those are all, uh, you know, various inflammatory exudates that would stimulate pain receptors. 
But she was. She she's a great example because her her mechanism of injury was a mechanical trauma, just like just like a, a head injury. Yeah, and and she had a mild fracture. So here here's the the thing that I can't say for sure, but I can tell you that ninety nine point nine nine percent. This is somebody with pre existing tender points and vasospasm in that quadrant. Yeah. Because this kind of fracture should not not cause that type of a trapped inflammation in a healthy pathway. So she had pre existing pre-lymphatic channel dysfunction from whatever in her past. And then all that bruising was unable to, to get out of there. Right. So like, it's, you know, going back to our, our post-concussion uh, kind of topic here, that's the person who's on their fourth concussion, right? The football player on their fourth concussion. So they've already had the dysfunction from one, two, three, and then. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So here's the key with that. And we, and anybody who's on the feed there who follows, you know, the sports medicine world, the research shows it's not the severity of the concussion, it's the number of concussions. And if you now look at this paradigm from the fact that each time you get a bit of a vasospasm, that it becomes residual from the trapped chemical loop. Well, now it takes less of a trauma to create more inflammation and get more vasospasm. So each, 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 until you had this massive, massive vasospasm. And each time the vessel protects, the muscle protects, it, it's easier to trigger. And towards the end of some of these people's careers, you know, like they're barely getting hit and getting a concussion uh, because it's just preset, if you will, yeah, with vasos, in, yep, with vasospasm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that that's where we, we really are able to see it. And, you know, again, in the future here, uh, you know, we'd love to do some higher tech, super expensive research and see this stuff, you know, all the way up into the brain. Right now, we're just hearing all the improvements, but we can um, visualize what, you know, imagine what it would look like. So let's look at the other side, uh, the artery side, because that sympathetic activation from those reflex arcs from any trapped inflammation will cause vasospasm on both sides okay so when we do these releases we're decreasing artery you know spasm and we open up the venous so you get more in and more out and it's a flushing effect goes back to normal which gets rid of all the chemicals and bacteria that's the normal but when you get the sympathetic activation at that level of the trapped you know problem you get spasm on both sides everything slows down you can start to get breakdown of tissue if it's there long-term, trophic changes, degenerative changes, chronic swelling, chronic pain. But anyway, so here's an artery example. So this guy was a patient of mine who was coming down the ladder, put his ankle through the ladder, snapped his leg clean in half because he fell off the ladder and landed on the ground, luckily, but his foot was still on the ladder, snapped in half. Um, compound tip fib fracture and tore two of the three main arteries, posterior tibial and fibular. Underwent the shock trauma, ORIF at, at uh, you know, Maryland Surgery Center and two plates, eight screws to fix the bones. Um, his, he had to undergo vascular repairs. And after the vascular repairs, they checked his ankle blood pressure and they found out that it was still basically zero. So they went ahead and put a femoral stent in to really open up the artery because this, the foot was not going to be viable and only got it up to 40 to 50 millimeters with the stent at discharge. So this redness is actually the surface capillaries maximally dilating to try and give the tissue as much as they can. But this is a very, very unhealthy foot. Um, the, it wasn't actually in the notes, but the, the patient told me himself that uh, both of the doctors said, you know, you could just amputate this foot and give yourself, save yourself a whole lot of time. And we're discussing that if, if he didn't make any improvement. So he knew a massage therapist who knew me and he discharged himself particularly after hearing they might want to cut his ankle off. And they sent him up for therapy, um, a two week trial, and then wanted to see him back because they wanted to do the therapy, but he discharged himself. And so as soon as I worked on him, uh, the good news was he and I saw that there was a immediate change in color after I worked on the vasospasms. So that was for me, verification that it was vasospasm and not scar tissue, possibly permanent. So that was great. It was a tonus versus irreparable damage. Um, by the time he went back to the second, at the two-week follow-up, the doctor saw the color change at that point and was able to palpate a dorsalis pedis pulse. And he said to the patient, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up. He goes, you know, amputation is off the table. Um, whatever the hell you're doing, keep, it, keep going. Sent him back. We continued to work on him through the six weeks. Uh, he went back and got his official testing. Ankle brachial pulse should be about 107 blood pressure in the ankle. It was 50 at discharge. It was 105 at six weeks. And there was the six week picture. 
So this is the artery side, okay? So what we're trying to show here is again, most times you can't see this, it's not this drastic, but if you had the deep vessel, you know, feeding the mortise of the ankle that had this vasospasm or an old meniscus injury and left one of these arterial dysfunctions inside, that area can start to degenerate. So that's the trophic changes. So yeah, I, I really sprained my ankle when I was in, in college. And you know, then you have osteoarthritis when you're 45 years old because no one ever fixed the vasospasm, okay? So that's where this, this starts to become, you know, a really a holistic technique of not just fixing the ligaments and, and getting the range of motion back and releasing the muscle. We got his motion back and we helped him with that, but we went to the vascular level, which in this case was life-changing. But in many cases, it could, it could really change where you are uh, 15, 20 years down the road. You talk about life-changing, you know, this is his foot. You know, most of our ankle patients aren't, we're not going to change their lives with these te techniques necessarily, but when we start treating up blood flow to the brain, then you do start changing lives. Yeah. So, so, you know, again, we don't want to overstep where the research is right now, but so many people through medications, old concussions, um, viruses and infections, which all cr crank up the cytokines, get these moderate and low level dysfunctions. And if we start to look down the line, what do you think that looks like? Well, I think it starts off, you know, inflammation in the hippocampus has been shown to block short-term memory, right? So the early memory loss, I don't know where my keys are, I'm having some word finding problems. Um, that's early stages or signs of this impaired glymphatic system and this venous perfusion. And then again, no one treats this. So it continues down the line and it becomes this, you know, ongoing vascular dementia and so, again, don't overspeak it, but we're able to, if we catch these people in that stage, we're able to reverse it. So I, I have to imagine um, we get these people in time, you know, do this kind of treatment, and we can really slow down, if not stop, some of these people from going down that road of, of progressive dementia. So is, is the vascular system the system that you think is, is being missed the most in, in people that aren't getting fascial counter strain? Uh, the neural, the neural or the vascular. So I, and I think the artery side, you know, more than the venous side, there's people performing in the superficial massage and lymphatic drainage, getting some of those superficial lymphatics, but they're not going to get down to the spinal cord level. They're not going to get to the ones, you know, in the basal complex that we'll take a look at in a second. Um, so surface lymphatics are being taken care of uh, the artery and the nerve. No, the viscera, absolutely not either. There are very few people who are doing visceral work at all. And then most of them are doing it direct. They're trying to stretch it again, which doesn't really drain. So I, I would say I see in my chronic people, a lot of deep artery and nerve, you know, neurovascular dysfunction. Um, and I see impaired lymphatic system in the deep stuff for sure. And then, you know, anything in the viscera, uh, I'll see. A lot of my musculoskeletal patient, you know, stuff has been peeled off by the time they get to me in that real chronic failed case level, but not the deep spinal ligaments. They're still in there. Okay. Um, you get into the ALLs, PLLs, of, like we learned in the intro class, the ligamentum flavum, a lot of those deeper spinal ligaments are also in there. Okay. So after vascular or, or with vascular mixed in somewhere, what else are you doing for your post-concussion or your, your migraine patients? Well, let's, let's look then a little bit more specific and talk about what we said we talk about. I, we had to go through some of this for those of you who don't know anything about the technique and so you understand if we target a vasospasm, what we mean by that. But if you, here's a schematic that I really like when we start talking in our lymphatics class of the head and the brain class, it's a very simple uh, pathway, but it, it really shows you that there are four predominant drainage pathways of the brain. Okay, you have your epidural basilar complex. So we treat the epidurals. We actually do the cervical epidurals, which is what this basilar complex drains into in the beginner class, in the intro class, we teach you this. So this unlocks all your degenerative joints of the neck, some of the disc and starts to drain this posterior pathway. This is your internal jugular vein, okay? This becomes the sigmoid sinus through the jugular foramen. And of course, one of the main, main drainages uh, of the brain right here. So both of these guys, you target them. This is your pterygoid plexus. You know, we teach this again also in our venous class. And then this is your facial vein. So pterygoid plexus drains the cavernous sinus, which is all your eye sensitivities, a lot of your eye headaches, um, facial vein. And what happens is you get venous spasm in three or four of these and all this normal drainage slows down. And we see people with vasospasm in all four. Um, another thing that you can see here, which sounds really hard to treat, but it's not our seizures, okay? 
people who are getting seizures and pseudo seizures, and we got video after video of this, um, they have all four blocked. And the pressure is building to the point where they're literally having these seizures. And it's really not that hard to treat. If you open up all four of these and you learn them all in our Venus class, the body will drop enough pressure, just like that picture you saw two days later. And you can stop somebody with, with chronic seizures from having seizures with four or five simple releases. Four exit points of the brain are internal jugular, facial vein, epidural basal complex, and the epidural basal complex. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so these four guys uh, are again not the only things we can treat, but you know you can have a, just a handful of basic techniques, and if you can get these main uh, vasospasms alleviated, the body will find a way to get it out. Okay, it will find a way. Right. Uh, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here or not, but. Those sinuses too, those are, are dural folds, right? That are folded back over each other. Um, so are you also finding that, that the dural releases are gonna be essential for this? Yeah, for this so, so the, when a, if you look at the world of craniosacral, okay? And, and basically they're looking at dura and they're, and they're doing some of this drainage, but not as anatomically specific as we do. You know, we, we, what we do is anatomically named point by point, and we do the exact manipulation over this exact area. Um, even, even torquing the, the cranium, okay, to, to work on the dura, as you stated, okay? So someone said, well, how would you drain the superior sagittal sinus? Well, it's wrapped in dura, which is attached to the cranial bone. So we literally get on the top of the cranium and we do the release, okay, right on that area. And you can get enough movement to turn off that diagnostic point. And the person will say, wow, that pressure came right out of my forehead. Uh, it, it's, as long as you know, the anatomy, you can do things literally through the cranium on these, on many of these vessels. Plus we've taken care of the pressure from below. Okay. But yes, dura would also block the drainage. So in our nerve one class, we do cranial nerves, dura, all the upper quarter nerves. And then you add that to your lymphatics class. Now you've got two major ways to really help your patients who have chronic headaches. Um, we'll talk in a second here, the difference between a venous headache, or I can even do it now versus a dura headache. Okay. So let's look at, look at headaches, not just post -concu concussion syndrome now. And I would say you want to break that down into three categories, the venous pressure headache. And people will often use that word. You'll say, you know, what do you feel like? Oh, it's just, it's just pressure. It just, you know, I have all this pressure in my head all the time. Okay. So that's a venous drainage problem. Um, you know, that the veins are directly or indirectly affected. Then you have this the chronic headache that isn't necessarily pressure-based. And if you look at the diagnostic point, it's not a venous. And that could be a dura headache. And when you get into the dura, let me see which where I am here. Good, it's next slide. Now you're looking at what is called the trigeminal spinal nucleus, okay? So the dura itself of the, of the brain, which is this right here, is, this is all the dura, the falks, the tent, all these guys, is actually from the tent up is innervated by the trigeminal nerve and it's all fascia and it all has pain receptors as well. Okay. So it can all be a pain generator from the tentorium below down into the dural tube that is fed by the cervicals, upper cervicals. So cervical one, cervical two, cervical three, and the trigeminal nerves actually communicate through the spinal trigeminal nucleus. So this is a dura cervical headache. So cervical uh, genic headache is a totally different type of headache. So we can target all the structures at C1, C2, C3, and the trigeminal nerve and the dura to help that whole subset of headaches. How did we know that? Diagnostic tender points and the cranial scan. Um, if we have a venous headache, we target this. We have a, a cervical trigeminal, you know, cervicogenic headache, dura headache, we target those neural structures, okay? Could someone have both? Yes. Those are, those are DPRs or VPRs or both? Yeah, well, so in the case of what it is, the nociceptors that go into C1, C2, C3 have a convergence with trigeminal. So any tissue, Kyle, any tissue. At, so we could do uh, facet work. We could do muscle work. Here's an example. I threw this in for you guys. So the rectus capitis posterior minor, which is a muscle, actually attach, attaches directly to the dura. So this, is, this was discovered actually right where I am here at University of Maryland. They found these direct techniques or direct connections into the dura. So this is where C2 directly affects the dura, but neurologically through trigeminal convergence at the dorsal horn, it also affects all the way up into the head. 
Now here's your DPR. This is your DPR of the greater occipital nerve, Kyle, C1, mm -hmm. C2. Yep. It actually has an anastomosis with the ophthalmic branch of the, of the trigeminal. So you can do trigeminal one release and then the C1 release and really help that, that scalp eye headache. Boom, knock it out real quick. Are you co-treating any of these patients with, with a, a traditional therapist who's doing the accommodation and desensitization stuff? Or is um, it, I, I actually, I actually uh, would be more than open to do that. There's a concussion clinic near me in Hagerstown. Um, I, the guy has approached me several times to have a meeting and we have not had a meeting because I'm just too darn busy, but I, I would like to meet the guy. Yeah. And, um, you know, have, have us go back and forth and, and see how this work really affects the people he's stuck on. So I will do that in the future. It's just, my schedule is just a zoo. What do you think it would do? I think it would, I think he would find, well, I, I've, I, let's take this back. Let me take it back. I have done it. I actually have uh, neuro, what are they called? Uh, it's a certain kind of neurologist that does uh, neuro, neurological testing. And there's 18 different diagnostic tests of the eye and neurological tests that they do. Um, I've had them where they plateaued and they referred back and forth and rechecked. And they've actually told me what part they're seeing is dysfunctional through their evaluation. Yeah. I'll target the anatomy. They go back and it changes every time. Uh, the one traumatic brain injury is a, a lady, uh, occupational therapist that I've worked on for several years. I have the whole video case series for the brain class. And um, that's exactly how we did it. Once the neurologist realized I could do this, you know, she said, okay, tell Brian your convergence or your, you know, we still got a problem with the trochlear nerve. So now I would target the trochlear nuclei and the trochlear nerve. She'd go back and test again. She'd say, oh, that's great. Now it's, it's you know, oculomotor convergence. That's not quite right yet. And then I would target that pathway. It was really fun working with her. Yeah. I had one, uh, one patient. He was actually, he was a friend of mine. Um, really good basketball player and got a concussion playing basketball. And then uh, like that weekend, he had a bachelor party in Miami. So he went from being pretty severely concussed to then going to Miami, getting no sleep and probably drinking too much. <laughs> uh, so that cascaded into, um, you know, his symptoms were so bad. He, he couldn't go to work. Um, uh, he had to take a, a long hiatus from work and he, I think he went to some place out in Utah that did assessment, um, for post-concussion stuff. And it was like a four month wait for him to get out there. So, um, I saw him maybe five or six times, um, cleared a bunch of stuff that I know. And when he went, got tested, got his, his accommodation exercises, and they were like amazed how quickly he progressed through that. And now he's, you know, he's fine. Uh, but yet, yet Tim, uh, after the treatment, they were amazed by his speed of recovery. Um, through the, through yes, the, so so that, that is an application in, in sports medicine where uh, we do have some people, again, I'm, I'm the failed case guy, you know, as, as you know. Yeah. So, but Tim Hodges, who actually was, is one of our instructors who did the lymphatic arm case, uh, Tim works for the, the Portland Timbers and Tim has had the ability to treat the soccer players right after the concussion. And he had one case last year where one of the midfielders was knocked unconscious. Tim treated him that they saw that it was no hemorrhage. Tim treated him that week. He passed the concussion protocol fully by the end of the week. Hmm. And so they're like, all right, I guess you can go back. But he was literally knocked on and he passed within a week. So, uh, you know, speeding up that, you know, concussion protocol uh, is, again, getting that inflammation out quickly to stop this vasospasm from setting in, uh, you know, obviously is a thing. It's just that I personally get the 20% the that don't heal. That's who I work with. Right. So what, what uh, percentage of your population now, of your patient population now is, is this? So, so it's, it's really high, to be honest. And so um, I don't, you know, throw out a shingle because, you know, I'm always trying to develop the work in all areas of the body. You know, I want to, I want to see the chronic, you know, peripheral neuropathies. I want to see the, you know, I, I worked on a guy today with men's health disorder, you know, so I'm actually what turned out to be a cremaster dysfunction from the genitive femoral nerve. Very interesting symptoms this young man had. Um, so I like to work on all parts of the body to understand what the work can do globally. But I'd say I'm up over 50% head work now, brain work. Um, and that's simply because, you know, people are on Facebook pages, for example, they're on, you know, little chat lines with each other. They're in help groups. Yeah. And when they, and all that. 
your message boards and they're like, look, I, I had this work and, and it fixed me. And people just, you know, they just start coming out of the woods because there's so many of them that, you know, aren't doing well. The PTSD group, you know, we're doing a research study with this on PTSD right now. And the data is in and we're going to start doing our write ups as I could hopefully get this other article published. But turning down that sympathetic inflammation turns down the sympathetic drive immensely. And so a lot of these concussion people with inflammation in the brainstem and the central autonomic network and hypothalamus, where the dura attaches, end up with anxiety disorder as a, as a comorbidity, okay? And there's a really, really well-known case study that's you know, gonna get some publicity um, that I can tell people on Facebook here because she's, she's already having a movie made about her. So uh, a 2016 Olympic champion, Helen Maroulis, um, she's a freestyle wrestler. She's the first woman in the United States to win gold for the United States. And she suffered after the Olympic win, uh, she suffered a pretty major concussion and, and got some other issues that triggered some major PTSD and was not able to continue. And she retired in 2019. So her father happens to live in Virginia and heard about the work through some people. Um, and somebody said to me, you know, there's a, high level athlete that's just really suffering. Can you help? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring her out. So she came, she flew in and, you know, I worked on her for about two sessions and she came back in and she just said to me, she said, you know, I'm really not having these symptoms anymore. She goes, can I wrestle again? Um, And I said, well, you know, you were cleared neurologically, correct? She said, yeah, I just, I just, I couldn't, you know, it headaches, trauma, I just can't. And I'm really fearful. So I said, look, well, you know, start back in, don't bang your head. I need a little more work and, you know, I'll be here with you. I'll work with you. So so she went back and started training and obviously she's a world-class athlete. She, she very quickly uh, got a bid, you know, through some connections to the Pan Am games, got on the American team, um, you know, probably six weeks after I started working with her, eight weeks, um, maybe a little longer than that. I, I'm not hundred percent sure when it was, but she basically went to the Pan Am games and won. That got her a bid to this Olympic trial that just occurred. And this is all, I've only known her for about six months. Okay. So then she real quickly gets a, a, a buy-in from winning that to the Olympic trial again, being immensely talented and, and doing great. She gets on the, on the, on the trials 11 days before the trials. And this is her chance to make her comeback because you have to win your weight class. Okay. You, you, you can't come in second and go. Yeah. Um, she tears her MCL, you know, grade two, 11 days before. So she, she texts me or emails me in a panic. And she's like, she's like, I'm in so much pain. I think I, I think I screwed everything up. And I'm, I hear, I'm thinking, okay, you know, all this work and she's about to go back and it's going to be derailed by an MCL. And then I said, you know what? I've seen what this stuff does in sports med. So I said, look, you know, I'll come in three days early in a row. You come in three days in a row and we're going to just, you know, treat the heck out of that and inflammation of that knee. Limped in the first day, walked out the first day. I said, do not train. Treated her two more days. I said, do not train. If you tweak this again, there's no chance. They allowed her to tape it up. They allowed her to brace it. She went to the trials and she won. She, she uh, made all the way to final one in the, in the, in overtime, um, had a tiny bit of pain only in her knee. Um, and anyway, she's going, she's going back to defend her, her medal. And uh, Netflix got a, got a, you know, heard about her and she's very articulate, you know, great girl, attractive, you know, so she's Hollywood kind of was after her, but anyway, they, um, they want to do a thing on her life story and her comeback. And, you know, she'll tell you in the, in the movie and they, they videotaped me working on her one day and um, basically said, you know, she attributes two things to her comeback, God and counter strength. So, <laughs> so she made him come in and, and videotape the work. Um, and I'm like, you know, it's kind of like watching paint dry. You know, I'm just holding things. It's not real <laughs> exciting, you know, but uh, but they did come in and, and, and watched her get treatment. So beyond beyond not being able to compete, was she having other impairments like? Uh, yeah. So now she comes in, she send all her, her wrestling buddies from all over the country. Um, you know, she's like, hey, I got a, you know, a little kink in my old AC joint and you know, my back's all tweaked. So now they're all using us for like sports medicine stuff and they'll come flying in, but she's specifically sending in her, 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 uh, all the people she knows who's had concussions. And it's a, it's a, it's a group there. You can imagine in wrestling. Yeah. Wrestlers. I, yeah. I had the same yeah, thing. They're, they're whacking heads. Yeah. And the one girl was having, uh, she was a high school, high level training with the Olympic group there and she trains them. And, um, she was having hallucinations and they tentatively, uh, diagnosed her with schizophrenia and, you know, if you if you know anything about the Parkinson's, Parkinson's people will have hallucinations, right? So I went in and I I, you know, all you guys in the feed that are practitioners already, you know, the brain class is coming. 
but I can target the basal ganglia, I can target the drainage pathway. So I went in on a hypothesis that it was pressure in the basal ganglia, and it was, and I drained it out, and her hallucination stopped that day. Um, so pretty crazy symptoms that you can get from post-concussion syndrome. So Helen specifically, um, was she having like memory issues or uh, you know, other things yeah. that were affecting her daily life? Yeah, she was having uh, difficult concentration, you know, um, depression. Um, again, you start to mess with the hypothalamus, uh, you get anxiety, you get depression. These are all symptoms related to the hypothalamus. And so the HPA axis, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is pressurized and irritated. And then you get anxiety and, you, and she just was just, you know, just not, not doing well, you know, and that's very common. And yeah. these people, their symptoms are somewhat vague. They're like, I, I can't concentrate. I'm anxious all the time. I, I have headaches. I try and get back to what I do. And I, I, I start having pain and, and they're just they're just in a panic that they have to live this way. That was like the exact same complaints of my friend, um, the basketball player, exact same complaints. Couldn't concentrate, light sensitivity. Uh, he's got two kids, you know, his tolerance for even dealing with his kids and their loud noises was way down, um, depressed, anxious. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> Excuse me. so yeah, those are all the things that, that we're helping um, in our non-athletes too. Yeah. So, so, so um, anyway, you know, let's talk a little bit about the beginner class and just make sure we don't get too long here, but just make sure everybody understands what we're doing here. Um, so when you come in and we're, we're looking for more practitioners because quite frankly, the, everybody who does this at a level is swamped. And we, the biggest drawback of this technique is there just aren't enough of us. Okay. And as we start to gain more exposure, you know, there's just no place for these people to go. Uh, particularly people who need the really high level work. And, you know, we're growing nicely, but, you know, you could be on this feed for the first time and you think about all the areas, inflammation, all the types of pain, all the types of post-concussion and anxiety and plantar fasciitis and neuropathy and digestive problems, you know, who couldn't use some of this work? That's the point. And there might be 2000 people worldwide training, and there's probably only 200 pretty high level people in the world. And some states, Kyle, you know, you run the Institute there, um, some states, you know, we have nobody, right, that we that we feel comfortable even referring to. So uh, we really need more people so we can, you know, really expand our, our database and, and have some access for all these people who are really suffering. And so the first class, when you come in, you're going to learn some treatments and the rationale. We'll teach you how to do the cranial scan. Um, and then we'll start to give you some techniques that that base or complex of the epidurals of the neck and draining the base of the skull. You, you will learn that. But one of the cool ones that you'll learn in class one um, is actually the sympathetic system to turn down sympathetic drive directly on those nerves. And a really key one is we, we do teach the preganglionics of the upper thoracic spine. And what, what's so cool about that is the nerves that are going to the vessels called the sympathetics that cause the vasospasm. If you get a problem at T1 or T2, and it can be you know any system, but particularly impacting the, these nerves that we treat, that goes up and eventually is the nerves that go into the vessels of the brain. So T1 and T2 go into the C3 area, which goes to the carotid and eventually goes up into the brain. So you can do this preganglionic treatment of T1-2, which is in the beginner class, and decrease vasospasm neurologically in the whole head. So before you even work on the veins, you're already opening up both sides of the vascular bed if they have these tender points. So that's a really cool technique. Uh, that we can use just to stop headaches and irritation that's taught in the beginner class. And that, that lab alone, we see in each class just a dramatic change in cranial mobility after just that one, that one lab. Yeah, and, and, and again, if, you know, this technique, and we talk about this a little bit, you know, this technique is not for everybody, okay? Um, if you're an anatomy geek, you know, like most of us are who do this technique and you just love it, um, you love the anatomy, you love being able to target it and identify what's wrong, um, if you love to learn every day and, you know, really figure out what's wrong with your patients and get to the source of stuff, this is for you. If you're somebody who likes to hand out exercise sheets and, and say, you know, I hope this works for you, it's not for you. OK, so, I mean, you really got to like to get into the anatomy and say this is a puzzle and I want to figure it out. And those are the people who just love this work. And it's very, very rewarding. But you go through a learning curve and we'll teach you techniques and you'll use your old techniques until you get enough of this uh, you know, paradigm, enough of these skills that you just become a counter trainer. But the beginning, you're doing this and then you're going back and your old stuff till you learn more class by class. 
What percentage of your headache and head injury patients have that T1, T2 preganglionic sympathetic dysfunction? Uh, just about everyone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, this is, that's one of the first releases I do because I will not go up and try and work on the vessels if the sympathetic drive is high. It, it won't work. So I clear out the T1, 2 in almost every single one. Um, again, like you said, Kyle, it opens up both sides. It gets a nice reduction overall of the head. Um, you know, even just using a case in point, my, one of my, my, I have a massage therapist in the clinic who actually just does massage. And then I have a massage therapist who counter strains like us. And she didn't want to learn the wife, their, their husband and wife. She didn't want to learn counter strain because she, she decided it was technically a little over her, but she's like, my husband's going to learn it. <laughs> so he went through the whole curriculum and he's a counter strainer, but she's not. But it was very interesting because she, she decided that it wasn't for her and had her husband take the class because, you know, he's much more of an anatomy kind of geek like we are. But she said what convinced her was when we did the T12 on her, she had all this chronic eye tearing stuff and all this sinus stuff. And she said it just all changed. And she goes, you know, I, I don't really totally understand what you guys were doing. I think it was lower in my head. But all I knew was it worked. It she's, like, she's like, I'm sticking to massage. But she goes, but that one technique, I felt such a difference in my head that she made her husband train. And, you know, eventually I hired him. Right. Yeah. Well, let's go, let's go into a quick Q and a. Um, so if you guys have any clinical questions for Brian, um, please type them in the chat or the Q and a section now. Um, and we'll try and get to uh, just a couple cause we're already running pretty long here. Um, just as a reminder, um, if what we've talked about the last hour kind of hit home for you and you're wondering where to start, it's the fascial counter strain fascial foundations course. And we are teaching it July 16 through 18 in Pasco, Washington, San Diego, California, Louisville, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, Frederick, Maryland, and New York, New York. And you do have a $50 discount code that's um, valid until June 13th. And it's FCS live, all caps FCS live that you can use at checkout. So let me take a look at some of the questions here, Brian. Yeah, just to show a quick picture, this is a release of the Falk Cerebri of the Dura. And that's, that's what the position would look like. Sphenoid, you know, occiput parietal bone, compress and monitor the diagnostic tender point. So, and that just is a pressure, turn off the point and hold. Okay, so like I said, it's a little bit like watching paint dry. Doesn't make for a great movie, but um, obviously very effective. So one of the questions here is the, uh, the cranial scan. Um, which class is that taught in? So the cranial scan is taught in every class. And the cranial scan, you, you start the skill of the cranial scan in class one, lab one. And what we do in the first class is teach you a couple of the basic ones just to give you a, 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 um, the skill of feeling a positive scan. And then we give you techniques that relate to that scan so that you can go treat the techniques, go back and see the scan change. So that's really what class one is designed to do is to say, this is the skill of finding a positive scan, give you a group of techniques to go back and practice. Okay, A, you get to help your patients, but you'll learn the back and forth between the scan and the treatment. So, and then we take that another level every class. So when you take the venous and lymphatic class, which drains the glymphatic system of the brain, like we talked about here, you'll learn all the different vein scans, epidural scans, you know, standard lymphatic scans, the visceral lymphatic scan, et cetera. So it's in every class. So by the time you get through the curriculum, you have a large number of scans that you quickly do, and you're able to really ascertain rapidly what systems and subsystems need to work. I have a question here from Katrina um, asking about shockwave therapy. Um, do you know much about shockwave therapy and would it work well in conjunction with, with fascial counter if, if she's re uh, referring to like the shockwave therapy that they do on like plantar fasciitis and, and like the podiatrist use, is that the one she's discussing? I'm not sure. Um, she said uh, in treating it for PTSD. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm not familiar with that application. Um, so I, I don't know I can answer that. Um, what about CRPS? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, chronic regional pain syndrome. Um, and the reason they've named it that it used to be sympathetic, you know, dystrophy, you know, you know from our, uh, some, you know, reflex sympathetic dystrophy yeah. um, for, for us old people or call salgia, so it used to be called, is because it's complex regional pain syndrome because they found it's not just the sympathetic nerve. So, yes, we treat the sympathetics but it happens to be multiple pathways that are inflamed. So you have to treat the vessels, you have to treat the, the artery pathways, the, the, you know, the vein pathways, the sympathetic pathways, 
You got to take that back into the spine, unlock the musculoskeletal inputs at that level. So for example, again, this is something we'll talk about in the classes, is you have a person with upper extremity, CRPS, you know, the stellate ganglia, okay? That's one of the main players here. That's the C7T1, CAT1 nerve. So we'll unlock all the musculoskeletal things at that level. We'll treat the spinal cord vasculature at that level. We'll hit the sympathetic nerve of the stellate ganglia. And then we go down the arm and treat everything that could be due to the secondary inflammation. I have a Elizabeth here who works with pediatric lymphatic disorders. And ah. so a lot of the current techniques or traditional techniques that she's doing kind of work as a Band-Aid. Um, how about that population as far as um, some of the vascular? Yeah, so, so uh, the first thing I can say is I, I, I feel your pain there. You know, it's, it's a tough population to work with. And I get a lot of kid referrals now. Um, it's challenging because, you know, those little suckers move. <laughs> <laughs> they don't stay still. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a stay still technique. Um, but, you know, because we are, we have the diagnostic tender point. We're not just doing, you know, let's find a position, kind of hold you there. You know, we have a diagnostic tender point. So we can say it's the internal jugular, you know, it's the superior sagittal sinus, it's the preganglionics. And we turn off the guys that we know um, are drivers of it. You know, we don't, we're not down the chain on the secondary stuff. So my goal with these little guys is to try and turn off just a few points, you know, in the first session, it's painless, luckily, you know, and make sure the kid has a great experience. And then we bring them back and I'm looking to get three, four, five points out. That's it. I might even treat them for 15 minutes. And what's amazing with the kids, and she knows this from, from treating them, is that uh, they respond. If you can get a couple key things out, they can make this massive change where adults take the opposite. They take a lot of work. Kids, you, you seem to do one tenth of the work because you couldn't get it done and you'll see 10 times the response. Uh, but yes, it, it, it is not something that I think a beginner can do very well. And some people are just more gifted working with children. I find it very rewarding and very challenging, but um, it is some of the toughest stuff that I do, but some of the most rewarding stuff I do. Developmental delay, fantastic. I unfortunately, the, the TBI girl, one of the ones I mentioned earlier, um, was an occupational therapist for little children. And she, once I helped her TBI and, and she, she was a mess, um, she just sent me so many of these kids. And so I, I got all stretched out. I had like three of them a day, <laughs> but I'm like, you got to slow down because they're, they're, they're it's stress, it's, yeah, it's work, it's work, but it, it's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. You're like sweating after those treatments. Cause you're putting them on your lap. You're putting them on the table. Mom's holding it and dad's holding it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, it, if there's a, um, uh, Haley, what's Haley's name? There's a, there's a YouTube uh, video where I went through on, her name is Haley and I can't think of her, Haley was some of the B. She's a speech therapist who interviewed me for her podcast. So counter strain, pediatric speech therapy, it should, should come up where you need to go and watch it. But she interviewed me and she asked me to come on because she saw what I was able to do for some of her clients. And I tell some of the, you know, the stories in that about, you know, the, some of the changes are just, just nuts. But um, she's like, you got to come on and, and be my guest because I've never seen these results before. Yeah. A Buchan, H Haley Buchan, uh, is, I think is her name. It's her podcast. What about um, vasospasm causing high blood pressure in a PCS? So, um, you know, just the post-concussion, you know, the sympathetic drive from the central autonomic network gets knocked up a lot. And that's some of that brainstem and hypothalamus, uh, you know, drive can get knocked up. But um, if it's post trauma, then it will respond. So you can't say you can help hypertension of all kinds. But remember, hypertension is an elevation of the venous tone. OK, so uh, in the body. So it, there's this poor ability for the body to vasodilate and take the pressure down when it wants to. But you can get a concussion and, and in the area of the medulla and the area of the hypothalamus, um, the medulla in particular, you can pressurize that, affect heart rate, affect respiration, um, a vascular tone from the upper cervical region. Not super common to see that, but there are the number of, of possible dysfunctions related to concussion is as varied as the number of things the brain does. Let's do last question here. You talked about seizures a little bit already, but what about seizures in children? Any, any difference yes. there? No. Um, you know, you get an epileptic, okay? It's basically an idiopathic seizure. And if you can drain pressure out of epilep epilepsy patients as well, you can make amazing results. Um, I, I wish I had more of those kids, but it's not really known 
how well it works on them. And, you know, I had multiple kids that I treated just a few times. And as far as I know, they're seizure free because they were for a long time and the mother would have brought them back. And so, again, we really need larger populations in some of these things. Um, but seizures are one of those things. If they're not seizures due to certain birth defects, you know, certain birth defects that the brain's truly damaged, they're different. But acquired version of seizures and even epilepsy, um, you know, they really do well. A lot of times the doctors call them pseudo seizures, though, because they stay conscious. But they have, you know, convulsions and they, they, but they stay conscious and they'll say, oh, that wasn't a seizure. Well, I'd hate to drive during one of those things. <laughs> so, yeah. so we can call some of these pseudo seizures, um, but you can't function with them. Right. Okay. Let's see. Last question. Just snuck in there. Um, techniques, these techniques are useful for Parkinson's. So Parkinson's, there's a couple subsets of Parkinson's you know, and the version that is tremor primary and not the, the standard progressive flexion, pessin and gait, um, less effective, but does help. Okay. And the, but the progressive flexion version, yes. And we've had some dramatic pauses with that group. So the two subsets, uh, you know, flexion, the vasal dysfunction version, the standard version, the most, and it's a full body treatment, a lot of cranial, a lot of brainstem. Um, but the tremor primary less. Now, having said that, you know, during COVID, one of our tremor primary per people that we treated for a while, who still was on the meds, and she, she told us all along, and she would come in once a month, and we're so busy, if we're not sure we're helping somebody, sometimes we're like, you know, can you just not come back? <laughs> we, we, we got a huge wait list. But she's like, no, 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 no. If I don't come back and see you guys, you know, I start to feel worse. And my best days are when I see you guys. So Karen and I would see her once a month. And um, she was a young Parkinson's onset. She didn't come in during COVID and she's a fully functional young lady on med. She's really symptom free. She missed, she missed three months and her, her husband dragged her in. Sure. Her she couldn't even walk and she was, she was weak. She was shaking and she's like, see, see what happens. You guys don't see me. I told you. Um, so, so anyway, I went back and, you know, worked on her. And of course I'm always developing stuff, did some new stuff and she's, she's back to being herself, but um, okay. I got it. You know, she, she was, she was right. You know, we were huh. clearly retarding the, the progression. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this second FCS 101. Thank you, Brian, for your time. I was getting late there on the East coast. Um, we hope to see you guys in a course soon. Remember fascial foundations coming up here in just over a month, July 16th through 18th. Yeah, you guys can take a, a picture or a snapshot of those dates there for you. If, if, if you don't have them from Kyle already, um, there's the date. Jones Institute is Kyle's website. And I teach through the Jones Institute with Kyle's group out there in San Diego. And the Frederick, Maryland one is the one I'm at. And we zoom to all these locations simultaneously. Uh, this is actually the first year we've ever done 10 intro classes in one year. So we actually pretty much filled up the first uh, five or six. And we're, we're opening up a whole nother group here for the first time. Uh, trying to get this many new people uh, working with us and learning this this work that really help you guys love what you do. Okay, you guys will definitely have a, have a, a different career if you go down this path. And I will I will get this video posted since we couldn't figure out the Facebook Live component. I'll get this video posted on on Facebook here soon. So again, if this hit home for you, to please share this, um, share this video so that we can continue um, helping more and more people. Um, by teaching Brian's amazing techniques. Uh, everyone have a good night. Thank you again. Thank you, Brian. And we'll Thank see you, you soon. Take care.